And let's start off here with our keynote from John Taylor, group leader of Syro Data 61. John, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. You can hear me okay, no problems? I can hear you fine. Yeah, great. Gilad, did you want to lead off with something? Was that the plan or have you decided not to? Yeah, I think, I think, I think the plan was to, uh, to have Brian let me say a few things. Yeah, I meant to it. I just got excited myself and I just wanted yeah. to get to your presentation, John. <laughs> no, no worries. Well, like Look, I'll, I'll start sharing my screen while Gilad gets going. Yeah, it's just... Just a few words, um, just a few words. So first, if you missed yesterday, you essentially missed the ability to ask questions. So it's, it's, great, uh, it's great to be uh, live uh, on the session so you can actually uh, interact and ask questions and uh, get, get your answers and so forth. Uh, and and uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, for people that, uh, that are on the, the US time zone, um, wishing to be in person in Australia, that's definitely an understandable wish. Uh, so you don't need to be uh, uh, up late at night. So really appreciate, by the way, the speakers from the US and uh, Brian and Sydney uh, for staying uh, staying up late. Um, we have uh, we we do have great sessions today, um, and it's it's really honor to have John Taylor as the um, keynote uh, session for uh, for this morning uh, or this day. Um, I'm really looking forward to uh, to see the presentation about the uh, virtual laboratory for AI and ML for weather and climate science. Uh, we have been uh, working with CCIR for many, many years, um, and there is a, a great things and amazing capabilities that they're bringing to Accelerate Science. Um, so, uh, John, really appreciate uh, us being with uh, you being with us today, uh, and looking forward for your presentation. No worries. Can you see my slides clearly now? Yes, we do. Yeah, fantastic. So, um, yeah, slightly different uh, uh, topic, but uh, the title here, but it's uh, still the same uh, same presentation. Uh, it's a strong focus on uh, use on scalable machine learning. That's really one of the key things that uh, that I'll be focusing on in in this talk. Uh, so. Um, I'll be applying and developing a, a demonstrating a model that I've developed, which uh, uses machine learning. It's a data driven approach to uh, predicting to weather forecasting. Um, and it runs on high performance uh, computing systems. And I'll also be talking a bit about how I scale it, scale this code to, to run on the, the high performance computing system and showing you some results, some of the, the scaling results. So to get started, um, weather forecasting, numerical weather modeling has, has been around pretty much since the inception of, uh, of computing and uh, here's, a, here's a lovely photograph of one of our one of the very first machines. I must have some timing running on this. I mean, it's going to be an issue. Um, so you see. So, so, uh, so this, uh, this slide shows the, shows some of the very early uh, modeling and it also shows uh, uh, the, the very first paper that uh, describes some of the numerical uh, weather forecasting that uh, um, was first um, first developed. So, um, so high performance computing. Uh, we now know that that's one of the major tools for weather forecasting. Uh, when we're when we're doing our uh, numerical weather prediction, we're solving equations for the conservation of mass, the conservation of momentum, and the conservation of thermal energy. We're doing it on global grids um, uh, now at very high resolutions. The um, the the ECMWF, for example, I think weather forecasting uh, is doing reanalysis on a quarter of a degree globally. And also there's uh, typically um, up to uh, 100 to 200 vertical levels in the atmosphere as well. So numerical weather forecasting today, 12 of the top 100 HPC centers in the world are dedicated to numerical weather forecasting. Uh, combined, they consume about 50 petaflops of, the, of that uh, computing capacity and they generate um, uh, massive amounts of data. In this case, about three petabytes of data daily, uh, every day. So and that data, once that data is generated from these numerical weather forecasts, it's uh, circulated out to weather forecasting centers around the world, which then use, uh, use that data to construct local forecasts and, and make them available to uh, communities around the world. So this is a, it's a major, a major numerical weather forecast, numerical weather prediction. It's a major activity uh, globally, and it's a major consumer of, um, of uh, computing resources. 
It's also been a significant driver of um, high-performance computing over the decades. We're seeing a, we're seeing a broadening of uh, the community that uses um, HPC. Uh, two or three decades ago, uh, weather forecasting would have been the leading application, but now we're seeing many, um, many different applications on high-performance computers. It's becoming much broader. So one of the key tools that I've used to... Um, to build uh, the modeling system uh, uh, that, I that I'll demonstrate was Horovod. It's integrated into TensorFlow, Keras, and PyTorch. It's pretty much become the standard for uh, building uh, machine learning models uh, that can scale on high-performance computers. In the back end, it's using, um, using MPI, so it's leveraging the, the massive investment in by the HPC community in developing message passing interfaces. So it's super efficient uh, at, at moving data between uh, the different GPUs. The, uh, the, yeah, the performance is, uh, I'll be showing you some performance data later on in, in the presentation, but uh, the, the, um, the, all, the MPI all reduce is being used to, um, to, to, to average the, uh, the model parameters as we're, as we're tuning, as we're training the model, we're, we're setting um, different sets of parameters at the end of each epoch. We then exchange those values at the end of each epoch and we use the MPI infrastructure to allow those uh, variables to be exchanged very efficiently. So it's important to understand that the, the, these models are not embarrassingly parallel. Uh, it can appear as though they're embarrassingly parallel because uh, using Horovod, the exchange of the data is so rapid that you see very, very good scaling on, um, on high-performance computers. I'll show you a graph later which, where I've scaled it out to more than, more than 1,024 uh, GPUs. And I could have gone further just that the problem size just uh, didn't warrant going any further than 1,024 GPUs. But the, the scaling performance is, is really quite excellent. So a key conclusion, I think, here is that uh, HPC and um, uh, and, and machine learning are actually very compatible and it's very likely, I would imagine, that HPC will become a key driver for um, machine learning going forward in the future. It's not these two things are not separate activities. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of work can be done on, on single GPU cards on a single server, but it's, I think as we go to the more challenging problems, and that's what I'll be showing here today, as we go to these more challenging problems, we really do need supercomputers and uh, the ability to scale them is scale these computations on, on our very largest um, HPC systems is a is a vital component of, of, of that work. So Horovod is a largely it's a data parallel approach. Um, this this diagram here just illustrates quickly how that process works. So you you you'll separate the you divide your data set up. So you might have say hundreds of thousands of uh, of uh, images or data points that you want to are used for training, um, instances for training. You'll separate those, those, that training data up into the, by the number of uh, GPUs that you want to run it on. You then run, then start training your model. You'll set, construct a set of gradients, and then you'll exchange those gradients between the different uh, instances of the model running on the different GPUs. You'll average the gradients, and then you'll start the, the training process over again. So this uh, data parallel approach works very efficiently. There's also what's known as a model parallel approach, and that the model parallel approach is designed to um, to take that model when when as the models become quite large, they start to fill GPU memory uh, at 16 gigabytes and 32 gigabytes on some of the the GPUs that are available to us today. Uh, that's actually that's actually a significant limitation. The models that, uh, that I'll be showing you today that I've developed actually fill the GPU once we start using larger image sizes. So I'm using images that are 1440 by 720. And uh, that an image size with a relatively large model, it doesn't even have to be a very large model, uh, it will fill the GPU memory. So there is some interest in, I, I, I have some interest in, having access to GPUs that have got more memory. So the next generation, I think, is, is, is going to play an important role there with, with uh, I think, 80 gig on the V100 and potentially a lot more memory on, on some of the AMD products that are coming out. And also the plans, I think the NVIDIA plans for the Grace architecture 
I think they also show promise for dramatically increasing the memory available to allow us to build large complex models. In the science domain, this is probably going to be essential. Building these, the need for large models is going to become essential. And I'll, I'll discuss that a bit, bit more later on as well. But the data parallel approach has actually proved to be very useful. Um, but we also need to consider how we're going to parallelize the models. That, that is not as clear cut. But I feel as though this, the data parallel approach is pretty well managed at this point. So the example I'm going to give you is um, predicting uh, two things. One I'm going to do is uh, predict uh, surface precipitation, and I'm going to do that as effectively as an outcast. And I'm going to do that using uh, geopotential height to then predict uh, surface precipitation at three levels. So, so I have uh, data that's uh, been taken from uh, the ECMWF Era 5 uh, reanalysis product. It's on a 1440 by 720 grid. That's a quarter degree grid globally. And then I'm taking actually taking hourly data. So I end up with um, hundreds of thousands of data points, in this case, 175,000 time steps. One thing that, uh, so I'll just go back, so it's clicking through. So the... I've got, uh, so I've got about 170,000, 75,000 time steps. Uh, what, what, you'll, what I found though, was that uh, if I tried to use a smaller number of time steps, I started out using just a few years. I didn't initially run on 175,000 time steps, but when I ran on a smaller number of time steps, what I, what I found was that the model easily overfit the data. So it actually would reproduce the data almost perfectly. When I tried to make a prediction, it didn't do particularly well. So it was only when I got to about 20 years of data, so I think around 100,000 data points, that I started to see uh, the overtraining, the overfitting start to diminish. So the models, these models uh, that we develop um, are very powerful, and, uh, and, but they, they also have this ability to, to easily overfit. And I suspect that for many problems that overfitting is actually a significant issue and that uh, you have to take great care to, uh, to avoid um, overfitting. So um, just to just keep that in mind, that that's a, that's a really is a major issue that um, potentially people are not aware of. And so when, when you're trying to or considering building a model using this approach, I recommend that, um, that you make sure that you've got a, a lot of high quality data in which to do the training process. So the model that I use is based on the, the UNET architecture. It's a, quite a powerful architecture. It's been used. It's a model that's been around for a while. I had a close look at this model, um, tweaked a lot of the parameters that are included in the model, but it's a, it's clearly been a, it's clearly a well-designed model that, that uh, it, um, uh, it was very hard to find sort of uh, solutions that would would easily improve on this model. So uh, if, you, if you happen to have found better ways of doing this, then let me know. I'd be very interested. <laughs> but it's a, it's definitely a challenge. It's a challenge to improve on this this type of architecture. So it doesn't. There are a number of hyperparameters uh, uh, built into the model. So there's there's certainly a lot of things that you can potentially change. So, but this is the this is the approach. The model that. Um, that, uh, that I've used to, uh, to, take, to go from the three input layers, the, the geopotential height on an hourly basis to then predict the surface precipitation. There's, no, there's also no free lunch. So uh, just giving a random set of input wouldn't lead to a very good prediction of the output precipitation. So people tend to think of these models as being black boxes they're not pure black boxes. Um, you can't just take the take an, any old input data and then and produce a really good uh, prediction. So, the fact that um, the geopotential height data does deliver a very good prediction of um, surface precipitation, and I'm showing that this that here now. So, the top left corner here, this is the error the error five precipitation field that I'm trying to predict. I've got two geopotential height fields that I've included in this graph that, uh, that I use. I actually use three, doesn't conveniently fit. And then finally, the predicted values are down down here on, on the right-hand side. And you'll find it quite, the, the graphs that are showing the precipitation are actually log scale, so that's particularly challenging. But you'll find it quite difficult to actually pick up the differences between the, the error fire precipitation and the machine learning models predicted um, precipitation. So as I was saying, the, the key point here too is that um, geopotential height 
uh, clearly contains a significant amount of information about um, precipitation and precipitation fields. Geopotential height, in particular the 500 hectare pascal geopotential height, that's been used as a key driver for weather forecasting for decades. Probably prior to the to the um, numerical weather forecasting becoming a significant factor, people would have constructed graphs of geopotential height at 500 hectare pascals from balloons in order to get a sense of what of how the weather might be changing in order to construct weather forecasts. So it's quite a it's a traditional field that's been used for weather forecasting for some time. So it's not surprising then that that field happens to be a particularly good uh, predictor of, um, of uh, surface precipitation. So here's, a, here's an animation over a number of uh, time steps. Uh, on, the, on the left, you've got the, um, the error five precipitation. So that's the field that I'm trying to match. And then on the right, you've got the predicted uh, 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 precipitation field. So training the model, you'll see that training the model, you know, takes a, takes large numbers of GPUs and it runs for quite some time in order to, to train it. But once you've actually trained the model, then it just requires a few megabytes of, of input uh, geopotential height fields in order to predict the precipitation field. So once you've trained the model, you could actually run it on, a, on an iPhone and, and get a set of predictions. So the training process expensive, laborious, but once you've got the model trained, then you can make predictions uh, pretty quickly and, and easily with, uh, with the trained model. So that's probably one of the key advantages. There's lots of potential applications. I'm, I'm giving you one example here, there's, but there's lots of other things we could do with this, this type of model, including downscaling and a range of other applications. And I think, and also potentially constructing ensembles at, uh, at very low computational cost. Instead of having to run a large complex model, you could run a machine learning model and deliver the same, same results at very low uh, computational cost. So the, the, the next uh, feature of this particular study was uh, then taking the time series of geopotential height and then predicting out into the future. So try and predict geopotential height. As I mentioned, the geopotential height is one of the, the key uh, parameters that, um, that uh, people use for constructing weather forecasting maps. As I showed in the previous example, it's a very good predictor of uh, surface precipitation. In this case, I'm just predicting a single field, the geopotential light out into the future. I'm using uh, a number of past um, uh, geopotential height fields in order to be able to predict uh, future geopotential height. In this case, I'm, I'm predicting out to about 24 hours from the original, um, the origin point of the prediction. Uh, in a, using hourly data. And I'm showing about four time steps in this graph. I'll show them in a bit more detail in, in the next slide. So if you, if you look, it's very hard to actually tell the difference. If you look at the two fields, it's hard to tell where the differences are. So I've got a graph. The third graph is the difference between the model predictions and, and the error five data that I'm trying to forecast. The difference model, the scale on that axis is about 3x um, finer scale than, than the graphs themselves. So it's actually quite a, a zoom in on the, on the error term that's uh, appearing. And what you'll see is that as, as the systems at mid-latitudes uh, evolve, that, uh, that's where the error tends to, to creep in. Uh, and so by the time you get down to the bottom graph, you've got, you've got larger errors, uh, still not particularly significant, not huge errors, but they mostly relate to the location, the position of where the um, 500 hectopascal heights uh, have moved to. So let's, we can look at it in a bit more detail. This is the first two figures. So as I mentioned, the, the error, you can see at the early stages of the prediction that the, the uncertainty is quite small, and, but it is immediately obvious that the, the, the errors are going to appear at, uh, at mid-latitudes where, the, where, where you have uh, systems moving rapidly around the globe. And so as time evolves, you see those, those um, uh, errors start to accumulate. The next graph down, you're seeing a bit more of an increase and then so on. And then finally, at the end of the, at the, end of the prediction, you're, you're starting to see 
Uh, you can see very clearly now that the errors are mostly accumulating uh, at mid-latitudes. And again, this reflects more the location. If you look at the two graphs on the left, you can see that, that the issues relate to the location of where uh, the systems are moving around the, around the globe at mid-latitudes. So in order to obtain those models, uh, I also investigated the number of uh, time steps in the past that you needed to um, needed in order to get an accurate forecast. So uh, this is showing graphs for two, four, six, eight, and ten uh, time steps in the past. It's not as smoothly varying. It looks like it might be smoothly, but if you look at it, the worst model fit was actually at six uh, time steps. So, but it wasn't round. I started to see stable predictions, a linear growth in the error term. So. Uh, and the, the dotted line is, uh, is the climatology and the, the orange line is, uh, is persistence. So persistence is just assuming that the current weather is uh, yesterday's weather, tomorrow's weather is the same as today's weather and then rolling that forward. Eventually that orange line will asymptote to a constant. And so you will just be, uh, you'll just be comparing a random field with a random field and that will be the, the root mean square error that are, would arise from that particular situation. And then there's a climatology. That's actually a pretty tough thing to get to get under because it's a it's a quite a low value and a constant over time. So, uh, if we looked at numerical weather prediction models, um, the accuracy would be much higher. They they would have almost over this time period that that curve would be almost uh, constant and very low, probably as low as the early stages in this forecast, and it would stay quite low over this this time period. But the, so the, the key point here is with our data-driven approaches, I've got to the point where we're somewhere between probably what a numerical weather forecast would deliver uh, and, and uh, persistence and climatology. So those, the two runs with eight and 10 uh, show that you can achieve a result with a data-driven approach that, um, that delivers somewhere between persistence, climatology, and what a numerical weather prediction model would deliver. So we're in the sort of the range, the sort of what I would consider to be the interesting range. We've got to the point now where we're delivering something that, that beats basic persistence and, and climatology. It's probably not as good. Uh, I doubt that it's as good as a numerical weather prediction model. However, the numerical weather prediction models have been developed over the past 50 or 60 years, and so they've had plenty of time to develop um, models that are very highly capable and uh, deliver very high quality forecasts. I feel that these results really show the potential for numerical weather prediction models to deliver uh, forecasts that potentially might be equivalent to or close to uh, what we can get from our current generation of numerical weather prediction models. And certainly once we've trained the model, the cost of uh, making these predictions is a, frac is, a, is a minute fraction, it's order seconds. Uh, not hours on a supercomputer. So seconds on a single GPU, you could, you've got a weather prediction. So I mentioned also um, scaling. So again, using Horovod and taking my 175,000 uh, data points, in this case, I've actually restricted the problem size to, to two years of data. And the, the right graph actually should say 10 years of data. That's got about five times as much. But this shows the scaling using Horovod by and dividing up that um, that data set into uh, either you know breaking up the data set into a thousand and twenty four um, small chunks and then analyzing those data and then averaging the um, the parameters across all of those individual GPUs. The key point here, as I mentioned earlier, is that the scaling is is uh, is excellent. So we're seeing really good really good scaling across out to about a thousand and twenty four GPUs. So these were, I was running these, these runs were undertaken on the Lassen supercomputer at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. So, uh, so that's where we were able to make those runs. Uh, one of the key tricks that, that, that I use, so the, the, two, the, the data set is when I load it in, um, uh, the amount of memory that I'm using, CPU memory is about five terabytes when I'm running the full, the full system. And so that five terabytes, I actually load most of the, the uh, input data into memory, into the CPU memory on, the, on each node. And that effectively provides uh, you know, a super fast disk drive. I can, I can then load feed the GPUs quite efficiently. And so I think that's why uh, part of the reason why I'm able to see such good scaling, as well as the fact that uh, uh, we're using, using um, uh, 
MPI efficiently and also in VLink probably within the nodes, using Nipple within the nodes. So I think this this really shows the the promise I think for being able to tackle um, major sort of science problems. So the example that I showed you there was really it was focusing on one one parameter. I do fill pretty much fill GPU memory when I'm doing these runs, and I can't actually. One of the reasons why I'll just quickly go back. If I go back to this slide, one of the reasons why I couldn't go to time steps 12, 14, 16, and 18 is because memory the CPU memory was GPU memory was full. And so that's when I and model parallelism, I couldn't easily implement. There was no easy way to implement model parallelism to allow me to go to, to larger sizes. So I'm quite interested in uh, what uh, Gilad shared earlier uh, yesterday uh, uh, with regard to the, uh, the HPC uh, system, that uh, test system that's available. Um, so that contains, I think, A100s and uh, DPUs. So quite interested in what we can potentially do using uh, the A100s with 80 gig of memory. And also uh, next year when, um, when the PAUSI HPC system comes online with the, with the GPU nodes on it, I think, again, that's likely to be a major um, uh, machine learning capability that's going to come online in Australia and, and will be sort of globally significant. So, again, I'm looking forward to using using pausey computer system to advance some of this research that I've been doing here. So we do, you do get bottlenecked by, by GPU memory. And I think this will be typical of um, many science problems that, uh, that there won't be enough uh, GPU memory to be able to, to tackle some of the big science problems that are out there with the current generation of GPUs we really need. We need the next generation with more memory and we probably need to also develop um, uh, more capabilities with respect to uh, to model parallelism. So, look, the second example that I'd like to show you is uh, relates to predictions of uh, sea surface temperatures. I'm just going to show you some preliminary results. It's still this is still unpublished, so it's early days. I'm using the same approach to modelling sea surface temperatures as I use to model the 500 hectopascal geopotential heights. So, in the 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 key feature there, the key point there is that I've with the uh, UNET model is that I've replaced uh, many of the convolutional layers with a convolutional LSTM layer, a two-dimensional convolutional LSTM layer, and that allows me to do uh, forecasting of 2D fields, the, the spatial temporal forecasting of 2D fields. And you can extend it to 3D if you, if you want to, but uh, again, I think you'd have some memory issues. So again, I'm using the ERA-5 data. In this case, I'm using monthly mean sea surface temperatures and I'm using it over a 70 year period. So from 1950 to, to 2020 to train the model. My sense is that that's probably just enough data to train the model. Um, uh, it's, it's definitely challenging with uh, limited amounts of data, but it does seem to be just about sufficient to be able to train the model. Uh, we're not always using only about 40 years of data, it was definitely insufficient. I could not train the model satisfactorily with only about 40 years of data. So uh, when I run the model, I still need to adjust the hyperparameters in order to achieve the best model fit to the training data, things like the, um, uh, you know, the, the learning rate, the, um, the batch size, the, um, uh, the, the uh, dropout rates, et cetera. There's a whole range of hyperparameters that you, you need to train as you go from one tackling one problem to another. And I make model predictions uh, using the validation data. So I'm not using, I'm not making model predictions on, I'm not showing results where I'm fitting back on the, on the training, on the training data. And I do have a separate validation data set to help me verify that the, that I do have some degree of uh, generalization left. So I'm, what I'm going to now do is show you some predictions over 24 months starting in, uh, in January 2016. So this data was not included as part of the, um, the training process. And, the, and these are model predictions. It's not a model fit. These are model predictions. So just keep that in mind. So... Here's this graph again showing um, the model and then showing persistence and then showing the climatology. I'm actually fitting to the SST data, the raw SST data. I have, I have uh, normalized the data. It's not just uh, straight out uh, SST values in degrees Kelvin. 
the persistence graph here looks a little odd. It's going up and it's going down, and that's because, of course, there's a seasonal cycle in sea surface temperatures. And what the, what this particular graph is showing is the, the the persistence graph is showing the seasonal cycle in in, um, in temperatures. What what it also shows is just how well the model is able to represent that seasonal cycle. So you might expect that if the performance of the model was poor in representing the seasonal cycle, then you would you would probably see the model reducing significant seasonal variability in the root mean square error that I'm showing here on this graph. But instead, what we see is a near constant. Uh, error term as we go through the seasonal cycle. So what this graph tells me is that um, the model is able to, um, to comprehensively represent the seasonal cycle and sea surface temperatures. Uh, so I'm using a, a near global grid. Um, I think uh, people modeling sea surfaces tend to focus on the 60 north to 60 south range. I've focused on the 60 north to 60 south range but it is global in extent. So I'm not focusing on a component of the, of the globe. I'm focusing essentially on the entire ocean. Um, the, you can see the model sea surface temperatures on the right. The ECMWF sea surface temperatures are listed there to, for comparison. And um, if you look at the two graphs, it can be tricky to see where the differences are. So bottom left, there's a difference plot, which is the, the model versus ECMWF. So at this point, we're about uh, 11 months into the prediction. So we're at November 2016. So this, this graph is showing just how well the model is able to capture those, um, those sea surface temperatures about 11 months uh, into the future. I'm using 12 months of prior sea surface temperature data to predict in the future. I'm predicting two months in advance, and then I'm using an autoregressive approach to, to then predict out to these temperatures. So I'll put two months of data back use the two, two months of just forecast as, as part of the 12 months and then keep going until we get out to 24 months. Once we get past about 12 months, it's just pure. The prediction is just running on itself. There's nothing there, no, no data left to, to help the prediction. So, um, so at, uh, the difference plot on the bottom right uh, really reflects the seasonal cycle. But again, if you look at those two plots that between the model and the persistence plot, you can see that the, the model is really very capable. It's not, it's not being caught by the, um, by the seasonal cycle. It's actually able to, to accurately um, capture the seasonal cycle and, and also the, the, variations on the, the, the variations beyond the seasonality. So this, these are some histograms of the model predicted SST. So it's for that same same month. So the histogram on on the on the left is showing the model uh, versus the the error five sea surface temperatures, and you can see that uh, it captures that uh, distribution of sea surface temperatures uh, very closely. The graph on the right is the error term. That's the the differences. So the blue graph is the differences. You'll see that it's centered around zero degrees Celsius and mostly most of those uncertainties, most of those errors lie between 1.25 and uh, degrees Celsius between the, the true values and, and the observation. Again, the persistence values, you can see that we're, because of the effect of the seasonal cycle, the distribution is significantly different and weighted towards much higher temperatures because we're comparing a January to a November, I suppose. Um, and look, one of the other aspects here is we can also see that the um, that the distribution is is centered pretty much around zero as well for the predicted values. So overall, we can see we're getting getting quite a good uh, prediction. One other thing that we can do is we can also predict the El Nino, the Nino uh, three point four index. So this this index you'll find commonly appears in uh, weather forecasting because of the implications that it has for weather in the United States around uh, and Australia and around the world. It uh, has a significant impact, particularly on the Asia Pacific. And we know in California and in Australia that the El Nino uh, and La Nina have very strong impacts on, on, on the weather. So the blue line is the, is the model predictions of the El Nino index and the Orange line is the uh, error five uh, prediction of the El Nino index. These actually do max, match, so published El Nino. The error five one is actually a very accurate estimate of the true El Nino index. 
And so what we see here is, and is a very good match all the way out to about 24 months to the full two years of the, of the model prediction. Uh, the correlation coefficient is over 0.9 for this particular prediction. Uh, this is a particularly, this is a definitely a, a, a good prediction. And I think it probably exceeds what's possible with other, other approaches to modeling the El Nino index. So all of this is really demonstrating that proof of concept of a virtual laboratory for AI, ML for weather and climate science. This can be generalized to other science areas as well. Uh, I think these are the key, this is really the key concept. Um, you start out, so if you look in the, in the middle section there, there's feature selection, model training and model inference. That's really the three key steps in building machine learning models. Uh, feature selection, choosing the variables you want to use to, to drive your model, training the model, uh, running your training, and then model inference. Um, doing inferences, verifying, analyzing, displaying your model output, and then potentially using it for things like weather forecasting or other purposes. So those are the three uh, key steps. In this example, I've, I've, chose, I've used the ERA-5, the Global High Resolution Reanalysis data sets. Uh, for the 79 to the present, I've actually used some of the preliminary 1950 stuff for doing sea surface temperatures. That data set is about nine petabytes. So, so I think, again, this, I think, reflects what's really required is very, is very large, very high quality data if we want to advance our scientific knowledge. And petabytes of data is probably likely to be the realm of which we're going to be operating in. We then need to be able to, to do the training working with these very large data sets, uh, scientific problems. And again, we, we're going to want to use our high-performance computing systems. We're going to use them with, um, with Horovod. We're going to want to be able to scale our codes out to, to thousands of, uh, to thousands of uh, GPUs. So I think that's going to be very important, particularly as we build more complex models. So the models that I've shown you, are, even though they really stretch the limit of what's possible, there's still nothing like what we could potentially do. So there are hundreds of parameters in that uh, ERA-5 uh, data set. A, a full global climate model would generate hundreds of uh, parameters when it's, when it's being run. So we're not emulating anything like what's in a, a full global numerical weather forecasting model. What we're able to do, what I've been able to demonstrate is that we can produce useful results, say for predicting 500 hectopascal heights, predicting surface precipitation, predicting sea surface temperatures into the future. We can do useful things. And I think that is really, that forms a basis for doing more that we want to be able to continue down this route. The fact that I was able to do this with 2D and potentially with 3D data sets means that it's also very generic. So any modeling system that's using grids, potentially we can apply these same techniques to it. So we can either build emulators, we can build tools that forecast. It's a whole range of things that we could potentially do with these, with the ability to, to model these 2D and 3D uh, grids. And then finally, we need sort of analysis tools to do that inference and verification. And that's where we get the, potentially we get the huge benefits. We get the very low cost um, uh, uh, use of the models. The models can do inference at very low cost and that we can do all sorts of things that we potentially um, will find extremely useful to do, like forecasting at very low computational cost, uh, do, uh, doing ensemble forecasting, uh, running emulators, et cetera. There's a whole range of potential applications that we can, um, we can use. So, um, so HPC I see as being really a central component, central piece of this puzzle. As I said, I'm looking forward to Setmix uh, arriving in its, in its full-blown form. Um, and uh, uh, I think that's going to be a, a huge plus for Australia and helping to advance our, our machine learning HPC modelling in Australia. So, again, I, I just want to focus on the fact that there's this AI for Science report that came out a couple of years ago now. It's, um, uh, it's been out there for a while. I think uh, we, we will see AI become a key component for scientific research. I think the results that I've shown, I think, show the promise for this, but I still think we're very much at the early days. We need a very significant uplift in the capability to manage that. You know, the, the, 
what I showed there, that uh, virtual laboratory, that's, you know, the scale of that virtual laboratory, the, the, the type of GPUs that will be required in the future, the, the amount of work that we need to do, there's really a lot of a lot for us to do ahead. And I think this AI for Science report in particular uh, just shows how widespread the potential applications are. If you read through the report, there's literally dozens and dozens of, of potential applications of, of these AI technologies to, to science problems that are going to be, and I think going to be quite important. Uh, ultimately, I think, for example, some of the work that we've done, the data-driven modeling work that we've done and the scalability. So at the moment, climate models and weather models are somewhat constrained. We, the Swiss, I think, have built a fully GPU-enabled um, weather and climate model. But at the moment, many of the modeling systems are limited by their ability to scale out on, on GPUs, whereas I've demonstrated that we can very easily build our data-driven approaches to scale out to 1,000 GPUs. And I think they could potentially scale out to whatever size system that we might want to build at this point in time. So, so I think that means that there's the promise that we could start to do breakthroughs. We could start to do things that we haven't been able to do before and potentially push the field of, of weather and climate forward because we're, uh, we're using these AI methods. So, so I think there's, there's significant promise ahead for the application of AI for science. And so some of the conclusions that, uh, that I'll come to that uh, we've seen. So the precipitation prediction problem really demonstrates our ability to scale our deep learning problems out to 1,024 GPUs. We needed to carefully consider the hardware, CPUs, GPUs, and the internet uh, interconnect capacity in order to be able to do this. The software we needed, we needed Horovod, TensorFlow, Keras, HPCX in order to ensure that we got that sort of scaling. So it's... Uh, the file system configuration and conform performance, how we manage data, there's some significant issues around that. Um, you can't really feed a model running on 1,000 GPUs directly from a file system. You have to come up with an intermediate strategy. We've seen people loaded onto SSDs, local disk drives. My solution was to load it directly into CPU memory because there's something like um, 64, there's something like 64 terabytes of uh, CPU memory on the 1,024 uh, GPUs on the 256 nodes. Um, and so I was able to easily load the, the multi terabytes of input data into CPU memory and then read from CPU memory. And I think that played a key role in getting the scalability that I saw. But the, so the data, the file system configuration and performance is, is uh, pretty important. Just getting five terabytes out to all those disk drives requires a very capable HPC-like file system. If you don't have that, then you'll probably be waiting a long time just to get that data out. When you, as you increase the number of GPUs, you actually increase the effective uh, batch size. So you need to modify the uh, scale of learning rate in order to, to account for that. So this is one of the other tips that I'd, I'd recommend for anyone considering going down this route. From the site, so... Um, we're able to we're able to move to uh, very high resolution. So previously, um, uh, people have done some studies using using machine learning and applying it to weather and climate models. They hadn't done it at the at sort of the, anything like the resolutions that we've that I've demonstrated here today. There's no there's no clear or obvious reason why these models should just work at much higher resolutions. And and also, so what I've been able to demonstrate is that that's Definitely the case. We can definitely go to very high resolutions. We were able to see the, uh, the model for precipitation. It did a great job of predicting mid-latitude frontal systems well. It did a fantastic job of that. It does produce good predict predictions in the presence of tropical convective precipitation, but there's no reason. It was actually quite surprising that the model did so well at predicting the uh, uh, of predicting the um, the tropical convective precipitation. That that was actually a that was actually a significant surprise because it's not governed. Well, I hadn't expected it to be so well governed by geopotential height. For mid latitudes, we expected that to be the case, but not necessarily for tropical convective precipitation. But what? So again, I think this is where these machine learning models, even though people claim that they're just pure black boxes, I think. Again, what, what we're seeing here is we're getting, it's telling us that there is a significant amount of information contained in the geopotential height field that's telling us about precipitation in, in the tropics. And that's probably 
a somewhat unexpected result. But it's, a, it's a new insight, I think, a new scientific insight. And so these, these data-driven approaches will give us some quite interesting insights. On, with the sea surface temperature data, I, when I ran the sea surface temperature data, uh, I did start out trying to run it using, using anomalies, so taking out the climatological means. The model, I couldn't get the model to fit, and I think one of the reasons for that is that I've, effective, I've effectively broken the physics behind the models, behind the data when I did that. By feeding it the pure sea surface temperature data, it actually captured the physics that's actually taking place that's driving that um, changes in sea surface temperature. When I, when I attempted to remove that, the, just model the anomalies, I couldn't get a model that would train well to do it. So if you think about it, you're taking out these mean values uh, on a monthly basis based on the climatology. So you're introducing just a step, a random sort of step function. And so it's interesting that it, that it decided not, not to be able to fit that data. So again, I think there's potentially a lot we're going to learn about our modeling our physical systems with these uh, machine learning approaches. And so I think, um, again, what uh, I think the conclusion then is that we've really successfully completed a proof of concept of a machine learning lab for weather and climate. So my two colleagues were Pablo Laranado from the Australian National University and, uh, and, and also colleagues from uh, Lawrence Livermore National uh, Laboratory as well. So uh, Brian Esti Sapinski was the, the Livermore colleague. And I'm continuing to work with, uh, with Lawrence Livermore. So there's a research article, a, a paper that's appeared in the International Journal of High Performance Computing Applications, which describes a lot of what I've just presented here today. And I've got a Python code. I've released a UNET LSTM, a machine learning model for spatial and temporal evolution of 2D and 3D fields. So the, the code here is really the core uh, model. It's the actual model that I trained. And I, I'm released it normally. I, uh, I've released this particular code because I think it might be of general interest to people tackling scientific problems where they want to model the spatial and temporal evolution of 2D and 3D fields using machine learning approaches. So I think it's a fairly generic capability. Uh, I'd anticipate that, and I'm also hoping that we'll see some see some further effort in investigating how to improve on this on this code on these approaches. So, anyway, I'll, I'll, that's the end of my presentation. Thanks very much for listening, and uh, I'll uh, I'll hand back to our host Brian. Thanks, John. Uh, great presentation. We do have time for uh, I think maybe two questions here. Uh, so let me get started. Uh, Way asks, how can Australian researchers gain access to US DOE facilities like Sierra? I'm not sure that I can answer that question. That'll probably be up to the US DOE, DOE folk to answer that question. I had a if feeling. They're online. <laughs> I had a feeling that might be your answer. Uh, but I figured I'd ask anyways. Um, the next one is, uh, Paul says, thanks for the talk. Have you tried to train machine learning? I, I was running, I was running on Lassen, by the way, I was running on Lassen at uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And it's partly because I know Brandis did Sapinski uh, quite well. And so Brandis was able to facilitate access to the machine. Got it. Okay. Thanks for that update. Um, have you tried to train machine learning models that use multiple time steps of geopotential height as input data to predict precipitation and how it affect the data training and model size? Yeah, so the reason I haven't done that is the model size would be too big to fit in the GPUs that I was using. So if I tried, I was only able to fit, uh, uh, you can see from what I did, I reached the limited when I was using 10 time steps in the past of geopotential height to predict future geopotential height. So 10 time steps, so I'd run out of GPU memory. So that's why I'm so keen to get onto the one of these A100s because it's got about, or onto the, the new generation at Citin, the Citinix machines because they've got a lot more memory. And again, I just re-emphasize that I think that this, this uh, the much larger memory, because, of, because we're using larger grids, to tackle science problems. Uh, the grid size that I'm using, 1440 by 720, isn't particularly large for science problems, but it was more than enough uh, to take up the available GPU memory. So this, I think this is going to be a key issue, a key driver of the technology, a key driver of some co-design going forward. 
a uh, key need for the scientific community will be the, the GPU memory and how we also, how we might uh, build large models without swamping the GPU memory. At the, I've had a close look at this and I haven't been able to, how to, how to, how to um, build uh, a, a data a model parallel system, uh, use model parallelism to, to go to larger data sizes, but I haven't been able to, to solve that problem. Um, again, I'll probably, I'm keen to actually to work with the folks at Lawrence Livermore to help me solve this problem because that's, it's, I think this is going to be a problem that many scientists are going to be facing. Okay, and then I, I have two questions that just came in, but they're kind of asking the same thing, so I'm going to try to merge this together. Uh, Jen and Stephen, they're, they're asking about climate change and how it's ongoing. Is the current ML approach still workable in the future, and are you going to need to adjust your modeling approach to these kind of changes? So the model, so the sea surface temperature model that I showed you, that was trained on 70 years of data, and then I was using it to forecast the present-day present day climate over that time period, there's going to have been a significant shift in, in global temperatures. So the models are able to, to um, uh, capture that, those sorts of uh, shifts uh, over a short period, time period, like a weather forecast, then climate changes are not relevant. So predicting out uh, even over a year or so, the, the shift in temperatures of sea surface temperatures won't be significant over a year or two. So you don't need to directly account for it, but I suspect that the model will have captured that um, the, the the trend in in temperature change over that lengthy period. Uh, forecasting on so the the model I showed you running the model and forecasting out for about two uh, two years. The, the sea surface temperature model, you could just keep running it. I run it as an autoregressive model, and so you could just keep running it, and it would then produce its own climate. I think it's I think it's numerically stable. The fact that it got out to 24 time steps and was uh, relatively stable is an indicator that it's likely that I could then just keep running the model. So you'd effectively have a climate model that would generate sea surface temperatures going forward into the future. At the moment, there's no forcing. I didn't include a CO2 forcing or other, other forcing factors um, to drive the model to... Uh, say, produce uh, climate change, but you could train the model, for example, on the CO2 concentration as well. You could include that as one of the, the parameters and then running the model, as I said, in, in that sort of free mode. So in a climate mode, if you trained it with a CO2 and, and other forcing factors, uh, you could then potentially use the model to predict what future climate might look like. Whether that would work or not, you'd have to actually test it, but uh, it's, it's, there's the potential to, to do that. Thank you, John. That was the last question. Really appreciate the presentation. Great start for day two. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.